Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Baroness Morris, Chair of the World Travel Market London Advisory Board, and the UNWTO, with whom we launched WTM Responsible Tourism Day. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to WTM London's World Responsible Tourism Day 2017. World Responsible Tourism Day is in its 11th year, and I'm delighted to be able to stand before you and say it is the largest day of responsible tourism action in the world. It is not only the many sessions and exhibitor involvement on the exhibition floor, but what is taking place in many com communities and countries around the world today under the banner of World Responsible Tourism Day. From Kenya to America via Peru and Spain, the communities of the world are coming together in the name of World Responsible Tourism. Since its launch, World Responsible Tourism Day has set the wider agenda in the travel industry. The huge success of the day has been and is driven by you the responsible tourism community. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your commitment, drive and enthusiasm which has helped make this initiative a resounding success. I'm very proud of the platform WRTD offers for debate and discussion. And this year we are addressing two key topics. The emerging phenomenon which is over tourism and how the industry should set about meeting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. As I'm sure you're all aware, 2017 is the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development. Over the past year or more, the term over-tourism has increasingly been used to describe a situation where destinations feel either there are too many tourists or where the impact of tourism development is negatively affecting their home without providing enough benefits in return. From Barcelona to Thailand, Venice to Berlin, cities and regions are now beginning to take matters in their own hands, regulating against shared economy providers, protesting against cruise ships and limiting the number of people allowed into fragile areas. Every year, I say, World Responsible Tourism Day's aim is to be completely open and frank with you. We want to present the facts directly and honestly. We aim to show you both sides of the argument. <clears throat> and above all, we provide the platform to facilitate positive change within the industry together. And I believe the upcoming panel discussion will perfectly demonstrate these points. The tourism industry grew by 6% in the first half of this year, the greatest growth since 2010, with an extra 600 million trips added to the industry in six months. It is clear to see why the impact of over-tourism is a concern for the industry. As an industry, we should be proud of this growth. After all, it shows we are doing something right. However, we must also acknowledge the effects of over-tourism and put in place policies to allow the industry to continue to grow sustainably. Responsible tourism should be the backbone of this industry. It helps us to give back to the struggling communities, to conserve amazing biodiversity, stunning scenery, and extraordinary heritage and wildlife. However, over-tourism is, in many cases, destroying the very environment and failing to give back to the local community. The industry must adhere to the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals. There are many great examples of strong responsible tourism practices in the industry, and these will be, highly, will be rightly highlighted and applauded in the World Responsible Tourism Awards at WTM London, which will be revealed later on in this session. All 12 of the award finalists are leaders in demonstrating the positive impact of responsible tourism and adhere to the principles of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. They are great examples of how businesses have met the new challenge of transparently 
reporting their impacts and communicating them to stakeholders. The stories of the winners and their achievements act as a benchmark and inspiration for what the global travel and tourism industry can achieve through responsible tourism practice. The awards highlight what can be achieved when responsible tourism is central to a company's ethos and identity giving the industry as a whole the benchmark to aspire. I'm very proud of the commitment that World Travel Market Portfolio of Events has to promoting responsible tourism. As well as WRTD, we have expanded the responsible tourism program around the world into Arabian Travel Market, WTM Latin America, and of course, WTM Africa. I wish you all a thought-provoking and productive World Responsible Tourism Day and also WTM London. I would now like to uh, invite Carlos Vogler, UNWTO Executive Director for Member Relations, to the stage. Carlos. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Simon. Thank you for having us here this morning on behalf of our Secretary General, uh, Talib Rifai, uh, who you know had to leave uh, yesterday immediately after our ministerial summit. I would like to uh, bring you greetings from the United Nations World Tourism Organization. Today we are here to celebrate, as Simon was indicating, the 11th anniversary of the World Responsible Tourism Day, which was established back in 2007 after a series of initiatives to recognize the need for all travel to respect destinations, to respect their people, and respect their environments. And I would like to thank World Travel Market for the leadership in promoting responsible tourism. We're also here to celebrate somehow 21 years of responsible tourism as a mainstream, mainstream concept in tourism policy. Before that, we probably were not so conscious as we are today. Indeed, much has been achieved during these years, but yet there remains a lot to be done. Since the UN uh, General Assembly declared 2017 as the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development, and it's very important to emphasize the fact tourism for development, UNWTO, which was charged with the coordination of all the activities related to the International Year, has been promoting, with uh, your great support, the support of all the stakeholders, the value and the contribution of sustainable tourism to development, to economic growth, but also to cultural and environmental protection, and also to mutual understanding and peace. So it's not all about economics, it's also about an important social impact that tourism has in our societies. Sustainable tourism is singled out for its contribution to very specific SDGs. SDG 3, for instance, decent work and economic growth. SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. And SDG 14, life below water but can in fact contribute to all 17 goals from gender equality to poverty alleviation, from fighting climate change to building partnerships for development. In, during this year and in all the activities related, we have been reaching out to all stakeholders in the travel and tourism sector and all its related sectors because we must not forget that this is once in a lifetime opportunity to come together and to make truly travel and tourism one of the biggest human activities of the 21st century. And of course, a positive catalyst for change. Not only we need to work on how tourism is perceived by the society at large, but also how we can advance sustainable tourism worldwide. The commitment of all the parties, governments, civil society, private sector, but of course, tourists themselves, is essential in capitalizing on this historic moment and building a more responsible sector in the years to come. To ensure that tourism can effectively contribute in making this world 
a better place for us all, we also need to work together mainly in four areas. One, setting the systems to measure and monitor tourism impacts so that we can properly guide policymakers and companies and share a common understanding about how we measure sustainability in tourism. For instance, the UNWTO International Network of Observatories is giving us already an important framework in destinations to do this. Second, we need to apply the Global Code of Ethics for Tourism, which is a roadmap adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2001, and that we are now in the final process of converting into what will be the first international convention related to tourism, the Convention of Tourism Ethics, which was approved by our General Assembly in China and is in the process of being adopted by our member states. Three, raise awareness among travelers on how they can have a more respectful and rewarding travel experience that will protect and celebrate destinations and communities. Is this concept that you've been saying in the video is the first time that we actually, as an international UN organization, we have a campaign addressed to consumers, which is travel, enjoy, and respect. And four, support and invest in innovative projects and good practices in resource efficiency and low carbon tourism. It is indeed about growth, as Simon was indicated, but it's mainly about how we manage that growth in a responsible and a sustainable way. It's not enough to reach the objectives. It is important to be satisfied on how we get to reaching those objectives. Thank you so much. Carlos, thank you very much. And I uh, would like to again thank you, the UNWTO, for their continued support on this absolutely fantastic uh, day and initiative. Um, that goes from strength to strength through the WRTD brand and also the Responsible Tourism Program globally through uh, WTM initiatives. Okay, shall we get on with the proceedings? I would like to now hand over to Tanya Beckett, broadcast journalist, who will now moderate the following panel discussion and take us also through the exciting awards process. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Tanya. Well, can you hear me? Yes, I hope so. Um, it's an absolute honour to be here. It's an incredibly exciting event, and within that, to be covering and talking about a very exciting um, part of growth is, is, um, is really a special day for me. Uh, when we report on tourism, we have difficulty with it sometimes um, at the BBC because it's such a fragmented industry. Um, it's very significant. We know one in ten uh, people are employed in the industry, and we know, obviously, since the financial crisis, the growth, as uh, we've just heard described, particularly in the last year, has been really quite immense. But, of course, within that is this very important consideration that consumers and investors alike are switching on to, and that is the question of sustainability. So not only do we have a problem with, with really talking about the tourism industry because it's fragmentation, but also the measure of uh, sustainability and um, how businesses are operated has also gone through quite a difficult growth period. And looking at it, and I know what we're going to hear today, is that we are measuring this much better. We have much more concrete things to say about how our businesses engage. So let's talk, um, let's invite the panel now to the stage and get on. And as I uh, speak to them, I'll introduce them. You have who they are anyway, but I don't want to go through long introductions. So allow me please to welcome them to the stage. So let's start um, with, uh, really, uh, as a business journalist, I know what drives everybody's uh, thinking, and that is money. You know, if you can get uh, a very strong link between commercial gain and sustainability, that for many industries has been the turning point in terms of, uh, excuse me, the way that they think in terms of environmental um, and other types of impact. So. Um, Martin Brackenbury, I mean, we, we've got uh, mention of classic tours here, but of course, um, you know, you are the long-term president of the International Federation of Tour Operators, so therefore, it's a good broad question and a good broad place to start. Do we now have 
uh, evidence that there is a strong correlation between profits, better profits, and sustainable tourism. I would, uh, I find that difficult to answer because I don't think that the sufficient um, evidence has been accumulated to identify that really well. Um, so I think, there is, as, as Carlos was saying earlier, we've made a lot of progress, but we still haven't, to my mind, really fully answered that. Um, and it is quite intriguing that um, one of the, the key problems we have is that when we look, say, at over-tourism, which are too many people going to a place, when you talk to the places where these things are occurring, there is then the question of economic trade-offs and whether people are willing or not to make those trade-offs who are actually governing the city or governing the place where people are going to visit. Um, so I'm not absolutely convinced that we have sufficiently credible evidence accumulated which will persuade people yet to change their mind because we have a lot of skeptics about out there as it were rather than in this. Yeah but that's a link between overcrowding which is what you're saying is the potential for overcrowding and therefore the damage on uh, communities in the environment and you're saying if fewer people come obviously there's less money involved however consumers are very interested now in this issue so is it possible that um, you know, saving of resources and also interesting consumers more is going to attract more consumers and therefore, um, quite frankly, they're prepared to pay a little bit more for something that they, they value more. Yes, it's, it's this question of how much more people are prepared to pay, pay for a better experience. The fact of the matter is that, that we have situations emerging, because we've talked about over-tourism so we can look at that just for a minute, is that by too many people going, of course, the quality of the experience deteriorates. So actually managing that so that the experience is restored, you would have thought it would be quite straightforward then to actually be able to charge for that experience really quite significantly. I mean, certainly in the Galapagos, for example, where they control yes. the numbers that go in, I um, mean, you can allow it only, and I think, about a dozen people off from a boat in order to go on at any one time into one of the islands to, to uh, see the wildlife. It, it's, they've worked out a formula to, for managing these things. But, of course, it is exceedingly expensive, but people still go in very large numbers. Jane, uh, uh, you're head of sustainability at TUI. I think it's fair to describe you in that way. And TUI is seen very much as a leader in sustainability. So what's your view on um, what, it, what it takes to get a company to take this seriously and, of course, the SDGs? Well, at TUI, we've been working on sustainability for a number of years. So um, from my perspective and from the business's perspective, we really have seen uh, the kind of uh, cost savings and business benefits that um, I think you are asking about. Yeah. Um, in terms of looking at your business through an environmental lens, um, I think you'll definitely find that there's, um, there's fat to be trimmed there. Uh, most hotels, for instance, are spending between 10 and 20% on energy costs, and most hotels we found can actually cut that by about 10% without much upfront investment. So we've seen um, throughout our business, uh, our direct business, uh, tens of millions of pounds of eco-efficiencies um, over, um, over the last five years. Um, but so uh, just to interrupt you there, is it really a question of focusing really on the operations of the business and saying, how, hey, how can, we, how can we save resources here? It really is that simple? It's about giving the time and the analysis? Absolutely, absolutely. You need to put resource and thought behind it, but it's absolutely there for the taking. But I think wider than that... Um, it's um, increasingly customers are sensitized to these issues. They're looking for more authentic experiences. And we found that we can track quite clearly over a number of years higher customer satisfaction rates at hotels which are operating more sustainably. Um, it's also um, in terms of excursions which are perhaps more authentic or embedded in the local community, higher customer satisfaction rates and a huge rise in demand for that kind of excursion. So, uh, and in terms of um, the expectations of the next generation, there's evidence again to show that they're more sensitised to these issues. So all in all, there's a very round business case and sound business case, I'd say, for uh, really focusing on more sustainable experiences from, from the business side. So when you talk to the board, it's, an, it's becoming an easier and easier sell every time you do it, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the figures speak for themselves. You've got, we've, got the, we've got the 
we've got the evidence in, in, in hard figure terms, and that I think that actually approaching it from that angle is, is useful. Um, it starts to embed this as a serious business issue that we address with targets, with measurements, with external reporting, um, embedding it into business processes and, and tackling it like any other business issue. But yeah. So coming back to what there. I was talking about earlier is the measurement of it, you, you feel that that is already possible. Let's talk, um, let's talk about Hilton, another operator, another very big operator. Um, Max Verstraat, uh, I'm going to go and pronounce your surname, even though I don't speak Dutch, um, Head of Corporate Strategy um, at Hilton. Um, what, what, what guides your uh, responsibility strategy? Um, Jane has talked a little bit there about that there simply being a very strong correlation between saving money and being uh, responsible about how many resources you use. How do you see it? Uh, well, first of all, it's very well pronounced, better than any of my American colleagues have heard uh, multiple variants. I could variances. even say Goethe <laughs> Morgen. There we go. There's no, so, no boundaries. Uh, no, but I will echo. I mean, it's a, it's a business imperative. Uh, I think for us, not only from an efficiencies perspective, uh, you know, we've also seen uh, since we started our, our journey and, and, and measurement process and methodology back in 2008, uh, we've seen efficiencies of over $1 billion driven from our energy, water and waste, uh, you know, continuous improvement processes. Uh, but it's also a business imperative because our customers, uh, you know, are asking for this. Uh, they want to know <clears throat> every time more and more what it is that do we're they, doing. How do your customers engage with you and ask you this question? Yeah, well, we see it a lot specifically in our meetings and events, platforms for meeting planners, companies, you know, who have goals and targets around this when they want to have their meetings at our hotels. So we implement programs like our Meet With Purpose program, which is our, you know, CR offering in the meetings and events space, but they want to integrate this in their meetings. They want this to be part of, of, of their journey. So that's, that's the biggest space where, where we see it. Uh, you know, us being in the supply chain of a lot of big companies, uh, and you're seeing, uh, you know, requirements like the modern, uh, modern day uh, Save React, and people having to report on their efforts they're doing on their supply chain to, you know, avoid modern slavery. Again, these companies are coming to us and making sure that as a supplier we're doing the right things. Uh, so it's, you know, it's efficiencies, it's our customers, uh, but it's also our employees. Um, you know, we have around the world 360,000 uh, team members. And half of, half of them, and that's a growing percentage, are millennials. And when you look into you know, the importance of these you know, CR efforts for these younger generations, they will choose employers you know, based on what they're doing to have positive impact in, in the world. And you know, we're in a very, um, very competitive uh, industry where an employee might you know, go across the freeway to a competing hotel for a little bit more uh, money in their pocket. But, you know, with these younger generations, if they feel they're working for a company that's doing all the right things, they're not going to make that move. And turnover is, again, high, high cost uh, to our operations. So if we can reduce turnover by driving uh, CR efforts, that's another positive. So that's a couple of operators. What about when you're talking about a region and how a region approaches this? Um, Kerala, of course, is a, is a, a wonderful place to go and that you're the person who uh, looks at this in Kerala, you're head of this uh, particular um, initiative. How does it work there? Um, you've, you've really made quite a success of this um, and, uh, and quite a mission, but how, what path have you taken and how have you managed that? Um, some years ago, uh, we confronted this question as to uh, how can we raise responsible tourism practices from mere acts done by small individual companies or hoteliers to uh, a larger platform, that of a village, that of a community, that of a region. Uh, and over the years, we've worked out a model which we believe has worked wonderfully in terms of creating uh, a network, creating an engaged uh, circle of uh, the community members, the local government, the local stakeholders, uh, and the visitor. And I think it's working well because each, each of these, uh, these, these players in this, th in, in this, in this wonderful uh, relationship uh, has been practicing responsible tourism in their own way, 
uh, uh, I'll, I'll uh, just take on from where uh, Max said about, about efficiencies for hoteliers. So there is this hotelier community that have come forward, not merely improving their systems in terms of you know, providing uh, better uh, waste treatment so that the environment is not damaged, by providing better ways to manage their power needs, but also going one step forward and saying, hey, how can we engage with the community better? How can our business contribute to the community? And, and we, find, we try to find answers to that, Kristen, by going to the local government. So you're acting really as a sort of coordinator of best practice. That's right, yes. Uh, a, but also building these networks are important. Uh, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, this village uh, in Kumarakam, where f 15 hoteliers came forward and said, uh, how can we engage with the community better? How can we up our business contribute to the community? Mm -hmm. And we found that the community wasn't really ready yet. They did not, they saw tourism as an activity that was really not connected to them. Really? But here was a, an opportunity, we, the government saw this as an opportunity. And we told the local government, uh, why don't we increase vegetable production? Why don't we increase production of eggs yes. in the local community, empowering women's groups, helping them to create small businesses and enterprises, and, and bringing the hoteliers to the table by saying, you got to be purchasing materials right here from so the community. A sort and, of brokering role. And that's, that's, we were talking about measuring tourism also. And this was, this was the proof of the pudding. Yeah. Because we suddenly had numbers there, yeah. you know, of, of the increasing contribution that tourism was making directly into the pockets so of the community So you can measure members. it. That's Absolutely. the point. Absolutely. Okay. Let's talk about Gambia. And Adama, I know that... Um, Tourism has been immensely important um, in the development of your country. Tell me a little bit about the path um, that you've been taking recently to engage the industry in or, your initiatives. Thank you. Uh, for the past 20 years, of course, I've, I've been engaged uh, as a practitioner. Uh, the biggest challenge we have is actually uh, to monitor, as Carlos said, uh, uh, what tour operators say they do and what they do at the destination. Sometimes there is no correlation. There is not. <laughs> uh, what they say they do and what they do at the destination can be two different things. Uh, the same thing goes with tourists. When you give a survey to tourists, they tell you all the good things, but when they are in the destination, it's totally a different ball game. I think these are the challenges we have at the level of the destination. How can we monitor? How can we make so that we go beyond only values in terms of economic values to shared values where in the destination we have the tour operator that we want that is looking at other issues. We also have the tourist that is not only looking at uh, coming to enjoy but also to give back to the destination. These are issues that are real challenges and if we want to do something right, uh, we have to go back, of course, to responsible tourism where all stakeholders must take responsibility for their actions. Uh, I think this is the only way uh, one can do it. Uh, but so how that's interesting, not, not simply um, acting as the broker that we've been hearing here in Kerala, but also taking responsibility for that. So there's a carrot and stick. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, there are some things that regulations will do. I mean, the extremes like uh, uh, if you exploit children uh, and other things that are criminal in nature. But a lot of these things are voluntary in nature. I mean, you can't force companies yeah. uh, to do them. Uh, how best to encourage? And I think uh, my biggest disappointment in, in terms of all my practices is our governments. Uh, the positions they take, they still count in terms of numbers and not in terms of uh, uh, real value, uh, in terms of benefit for communities and also environmental and, of course, uh, uh, cultural issues. Uh, they only think in terms of how much foreign exchange is brought in, how many tourists are coming in the destination. Uh, uh, that is really slow-paced. Whilst tourism is going faster, most of our governments are not catching up. Carlos, we're coming to the end of the year uh, for sustainable tourism at the UNWTO. 
is there a sense that a great deal has been achieved? And again, I would refer back to the sustainable development goals. H how does tourism feature in the priorities there as an <coughs> industry? Thank you, Tanya. Yes, the year is coming to an end, but the initiatives that we have undertaken are not. Yeah. We need to continue with them. I mean, this is probably just the starting point. But true um, tourism, and we indeed say sustainable tourism, I hope one day we don't need to use the sustainable concept because we take for granted that there is no other way to develop tourism but in a sustainable manner. It is interesting to see how tourism has been matching and the five objectives of the international year have been matching with different SDGs. And we have made a mapping of all this and it's very clear when we talk about decent jobs, when we talk about poverty alleviation, when we talk about gender equality, when we talk about business innovation, everything matches quite well. So I think that International Year has given us a tremendous opportunity to alert the society of the importance of sustainable tourism as an instrument for development. We still have a long way to go, particularly in what refers to official development assistance. Many of the big donors in the world are still not using tourism as a tool for development. And this is something that we need to keep on working. The International Year has given us an excellent opportunity. The connection of the International Year activities with the SDG has given us an amazing opportunity. But we still need to work in the after International Year on building up on the milestones that we have achieved. We cannot say, okay, the year is over, so we've done what we had to do, let's move forward. Let's move forward and continue to build on what we have done. So development, you're disappointed in terms of development. Do you mean, when you t use the word development, are you talking about the development of communities? Yes. What we've been hearing about what's the going on in Kerala. The community, mm. developed countries have taken a commitment with the United Nations to contribute 0.7% of their national income to official development aid. Many of them are not reaching that target of 0.7%, right. but even those that are doing it are allocating very limited amounts of time, to, of time of money, I'm sorry, and time probably as well, to uh, tourism development, meaning that they're not clearly understanding or we have been unable to present the message properly that tourism is above all an instrument for development. Yeah. It is also an instrument for peace, understanding, but development is absolutely key to attract funding from the international donors. Harold, would you agree with that assessment that uh, you know, progress has been made, but more to, to go on the development front? Clearly there's been some progress over the last 15 years, but and we see some great examples of individual companies, some of them very large, like TUI, many small companies of the sort you'll see shortly in the awards. Great progress has been made. But the reality is that most of the industry is still doing very little. And it's still, sorry. doing very, very little. I mean, the many people in total denial. Um, got destinations which have got an over-tourism problem, but which are in denial and just want more growth. Over-tourism, I think, is the example of what happens when you haven't done sustainability for 40 years. You end up with over-tourism. It only happens because you haven't sustainably managed the destination. When we started 15 years ago with the campaigning for responsible tourism, a lot of the focus was on what the tour operators could do. Um, and that worked really well for five, six, seven years. But the reality now is that no tour operator, not even one the size of TUI, is that influential in any destination. It's really destination governments which now have to step up to the mark and take the responsibility. And that's what we've seen brilliantly done in Kerala. And it, there's no doubt about that. You, you've exactly done that. And the other big trend I'd point to over the last 15 years is the breadth, the, the, the development of the approach, and we saw it yesterday in the session looking at priorities for the next five years, much more emphasis on the social agenda, socio-economic benefits for communities, but not just the amount of foreign exchange that's earned, but the amount of money which is actually being retained in the local economy. And that's, again, one of the strengths of what's happened in Kerala and to a, a lesser extent, but it's still happened in the Gambia. We really need to see now uh, destination governments and destination management organisations taking more control of the way tourism develops in a destination, I think. Martin, yes, do you think SDGs should be the framework through which tourism engages? 
I think the SDGs are helpful, but um, when you look at specific areas, um, I, uh, and specific, uh, if you're looking at Gambia or Kerala, you will find that there are specific areas which need particular focus. And uh, finding solutions in particular areas, you may have uh, big problems about um, uh, women being properly engaged in the workforce. There are huge opportunities in tourism to do that. Um, and there you may find that that's one of the areas where you want to be able to concentrate. So then that becomes a significant one. So there are, there are different things that can be... Um, uh, focused upon in different areas and, and different stages of development, in my view. Um, the, the, uh, if I might just say that what Harold has been saying is absolutely essential. What, you asked me originally, um, you know, where, where were people, did we have the commitment, you know, and understanding of the way in which the balance between the, the, the three different economic, environmental, cultural, and social areas were properly balanced, uh, but, you know, and profits were going to be made if we do, do, do that. Well, we have to find a way, and the, uh, the interesting thing to me is that the work being done in Barcelona is much the most imaginative and uh, uh, thoughtful ways of actually designing a, a city which is a tourism city, not just um, uh, one where tourism visit. It's, a, it's, it's actually looked at in the round. It's absolutely fascinating the way in which they're doing their work. And they will, I think, serve as, as we go forward as a model of the way in which uh, city councils and um, uh, municipalities engage in appropriate ways in order to make certain that, for example, residents who are not involved in tourism actually have a voice in the way in which tourism develops. So that tourism is used by the communities as something which is for their development, which is what Carlos talks about, rather than tourism using yeah. the destination. Okay. So that's what is so uh, good about their work, and I advise anybody who hasn't actually seen or heard what they've done to really focus upon some of the things they've been doing in the last two years. Jane, would you agree that a strong steer by either national or regional governments is helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely, but um, from a business perspective, um, there's also a lot... Uh, that we can do through our contractual arrangements with suppliers, um, through the efforts that we put into uh, training and developing and offering vocational training um, to young people, um, the efforts that we put into um, putting on programs that can help enhance livelihoods and involve uh, local entrepreneurs and small businesses in the value chain. So um, definitely strong destination management is, is critical. Uh, but I'd also say from a business perspective, there's, there's work we can do to enhance local economic benefit as well. And that's certainly a big focus for us. Max, thinking about it as being a chain between governments and operators and so on, one of the issues that the tourism industry has, and Hilton is no exception to this, is it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily own all of its real estate, right? So you may not own all parts of the value chain, and so therefore you may feel that you don't have control through the value chain. Is that fair? Uh, yes, it is. It is fair, uh, but you know, I mean, we have we have some, but limited control, right? A lot of our uh, hotels are franchise operations where we do not own yeah. the real estate, nor do we, uh, you know, manage the property. But we have some level of control through brand standards and and whatnot. I think that um, you know what's key uh, that we do in in that environment is around partnerships. Uh, number one. Uh, and then also in industry coalitions. Uh, and we have a, a great example earlier this year through our work with the International Tourism Partnership, uh, which we uh, uh, you know, helped uh, co-launch co uh, some years ago. And we, uh, you know, we, we were the first out there to uh, release uh, goals around uh, carbon and water and youth and human rights. So in, in this environment that's very fragmented and partnership has become really critical. And I'd like to add to, you know, to the conversation that's been happening. I think that there's also an issue of just lack of awareness of what uh, you know, the industry is doing. And I can you know, 
take, uh, on, I'll take, unfortunately, us as an example here in Hilton and, and as people travel and stay at our hotels, you know, we, we do a pretty lousy, poor job at sharing what we're doing as a company. You know, you'll stay in our rooms and what you'll see is a car that says hang your towels because it'll save water. Um, you know, there's really not much other than that. Uh, but so we need to, as an industry, we need to do a better job at sharing all the great things that we're doing and, you know, driving that positive impact uh, in our communities because there's, um, there's a lot done over the, past, over the past few years. Harold. I think one of the things that's interesting for me is what, you can see what the priorities of the companies are really when you look at their KPIs for their senior staff. I mean, clearly in the hotels, a lot of the KPIs now are around driving down costs in the green, on the green agenda. Um, but it would be good to see the same kind of pressure coming on hotel managers to be purchasing more locally. I think those are where you see the developments, when people's job performance is seen in terms of what they deliver. And I just wanted to come back to, to what Venu said in a way, because Venu, one of the ways of understanding what happened in Kamara and I haven't said this to you before, so it's a bit dangerous, but, but one of the things which now reflect on it, I think back to 2008 and the conference, and actually that community was feeling over-visited. It was feeling it had got over tourism. And I think that's a good way to look at what was done in Kerala. And it relates to your point as well, Martin, that they, they picked up the important issue for the community. There were two, waste and local economic development, the community benefit, and that's where you focused your work. Is that fair? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we, we had protests. The local community said no more hotels here. They were, they were at the verge of blocking visitors coming into the village. And today, uh, we've, we've just recently completed a survey. Uh, not only has a large, uh, a substantial number of families running into thousands, uh, uh, deriving direct benefit from tourism, but it's also, it's also positively affected the attitude towards visitors to the, the other part, who are not directly benefited by tourism yeah. as well. They also feel that tourism as an activity is a good thing for the village. So it, it was, well, I want to turn the discussion to what next. We've talked about what we've done so far. Just finally, because we don't have a lot of time left. What next? Where, where are you next looking uh, to go with your initiatives in India, in Kerala? Well, um, that's, that's interesting because we've... I, I used to call these, uh, you know, we, we tried doing this destination-based stuff uh, in, in, in three or four places, which I used to call our laboratories. But some, some results from our labs have been excellent. So now the idea is we're getting a little more ambitious. We're trying to find out how, particularly among the, the uh, you know, the groups of poor women, you know, uh, to use tourism as a tool for economic empowerment and poverty alleviation. How can we create a network of, of, of these uh, producers, producing stuff that's used by, that will be used by the hotel industry, the tour industry and other service providers uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a basis which can spread across the state and not be confined to a village. We are still local, but we're trying to slightly broaden the definition of local. Adam, what about going forward in Gambia? Where do you see the next, uh, think, the next initiatives? I, I think this whole notion of uh, Santa Claus mentality, where you have people being in charities. I was talking to a tourist that came to the Gambia the last time, uh, just, just in one of the stands, and he said, I said, what next? Are you coming back? He said, yeah, I'm thinking of an opportunity to come and start a charity in the Gambia where we can give poor people. I can get it from here and bring it to the Gambia. I mean, this mentality must stop. The people in the destinations must take charge of their destiny. Yeah. And they must start uh, 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 rolling out things that will bring development for their own people. So I think there should be a refocus on destinations. And here, in most of our countries, governments play a big role. And that's why I think the UNWTO has a big role to play. I mean, and, 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 I'm, and I'm very critical of the UNWTO because sometimes they only work with governments. I mean, they should start working with the private sector. They should start working with NGOs that are there giving the mentality that it's only charity that we can make us develop. It's beyond that. People must be entrepreneurs and market access for communities is key. What can tour operators do so that uh, the population sells uh, to tourists, 
uh, the population does not, uh, the, the government does not import everything, but people produce it and, and sell to tourists. And when tourists come to buy local, these are the key things that must be done to get developments in, in, in destinations and not the other way around. Please stop the charity. Yes, please. Carlos, please. I would like to address, I think, the, the, the criticism to UNWTO dealing with governments. Um, indeed, I mean, UNWTO is an intergovernment organization, so our members are government. Yep. But uh, we have, and normally when we say but, we tend to disqualify what we have said earlier, <laughs> but not in this case. But we are uh, the only United Nations specialized agency that has the private sector within the organization through the affiliate membership. We have more than 500 entities, be universities, and actually Martin Brackenbury was the chairman of the affiliate members community. I was the chairman of the affiliate members community in a different life of mine. So yes, there is an engagement of the private sector within the organization, but nevertheless, I would accept the challenge that we have to interact more, that we have to continue to develop this public-private partnership, but of course we are an intergovernment organization. But I would like to pick up also in something of this, uh, the, uh, some of the things that have been said by Martin and Harold uh, related to the engagement of the local communities and uh, whatever we call this over tourism, which I think uh, we're probably going beyond what uh, reality is over tourism might be happening in certain very specific areas at very specific times of the year. But it's not uh, an overall problem that it's affecting everybody. As a matter of fact, many people would like to increase and grow the tourism business. But I think there are three fundamental aspects that uh, we need to understand so that the communities engage and accept one of them is buy local. So you have inclusiveness and economic growth locally. Second one is hire local so that you can develop decent employment. And the third thing is that the tourism revenues are applied to protect the cultural and the environment resources. Because then the local community will see, wow, what a minute. I mean, tourism, which is coming to my place, is contributing to improve my environment. They're generating the funds that they are applying properly to preserve the resources that I enjoy in a much better way. So it's a state of mind. It's a way in which we also need to bring what is badly needed in today's world, which is mutual understanding, accepting our differences, uh, tolerance, and also a respectful and responsible tourist in his behavior. And I think we also need to work in building up the tips for the tourist to behave in a proper way, accepting the difference of the communities they visit and respecting them. Jane, just a quick thought. Um, in the communities where you operate, is there often a requirement or do you feel an obligation, a corporate obligation, to contribute to the well-being of those communities? Is that part of your thinking? Uh, yeah, absolutely, and it's very much part of the sustainability certification program that we run um, through our hotels. Um, so a requirement to uh, prioritise local uh, suppliers and local food producers is part of that certification. Um, but also um, through our foundation, we've now put in place a program whereby we're, we're focusing on uh, increased vocational training for local people um, and increased opportunities for, um, for local entrepreneurs um, to be involved in the supply chain because um, tourism is almost, I think, unique in terms of the economic ripple effects it can have in the local economy. The indirect and the induced impacts um, economically of tourism uh, are even greater than the direct impacts. So, uh, so we and also. Um, tourism in that ripple effect um, can benefit and can uh, impact on nearly every industry segment, not just directly tourism. So uh, we know about that by employing more people and engaging more local businesses um, through our business that we're having a very long tail ripple effect. <coughs> So I'm conscious of time. This feels like very, very uh, thoughtful and uh, uh, yeah, very sort of maths-driven and analysis-driven engagement um, with the issue. But Harold, if I could come to you just for a final thought, I know that you feel a lot more needs to be done. 
I do. I, I, just two things briefly, because we are short of time. I mean, the first is, if only everybody in the industry was doing half what the best are, the situation would be a lot better than it is. And that's not a lot to ask, actually. But there are a lot of people still doing, not taking responsibility, still in denial, doing very, very little. That's a challenge. But the second thing, I think, is, and this is a challenge for you in WTO, and, and you are an intergovernmental organisation, but I'm very aware of the fact that even in relatively small countries, physically small countries like Britain, the challenges in different destinations are very different. And national policy isn't necessarily very helpful. You know, what, what we actually need to see is city councils, national park authorities, one at a time, deciding that they're going to make sure that they use tourism rather than that they are used by tourism. But that is a very difficult message for you in WTO because of the way you're structured. And I think, you know, we need to take responsibility for working with much more local governance, as we do in Kerala, um, to achieve these things. Well, there we must leave it. It's 12 o'clock. Thank you so much to all of our panellists, very much indeed, for a very lively and animated discussion. Thank you. Thank you. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. So please remain seated. Don't go anywhere at all. We're just going to do a little stage management as well as losing our panellists. Um, and we are uh, taking the chairs off and stuff in order to uh, prepare ourselves uh, for the very exciting 2017 awards. Which <laughs>so I think we are there. This is the moment everybody's been waiting for. Um, the WTM Responsible Tourism Awards 2017. I've been looking forward to this. It's a great honour uh, to be part of these awards. A real pleasure uh, to be uh, presenting them to this year's winner. I am so impressed and humbled by just what has been achieved over the last year. Each of our finalists has played a leading part in achieving responsible tourism. Each one of our finalists here today is either winner or highly commended. So WTM London has taken on responsibility for organising these annual awards this year. Since 2004, it's been ResponsibleTravel.com working to establish the awards. Um, but WTM has now picked up the baton here, and the awards will continue to use the same process that we've already established over the last 13 years. And Harold, who you saw on stage, Harold Goodwin, has chaired the, ju chaired the judges since 2004, and he will continue to do so. So it's a transitional year, really, everybody, uh, for the awards. And in the UN's International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development, World Travel Market London decided to focus on the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Now, many of those uh, before the judges elected to be considered across multiple SDGs. So the judges selected 12 finalists, um, those which had best reported and com communicated their impacts, so you've got to measure them to do that, or uh, the reductions in negative impacts which they'd achieved. They, so the judges wanted to recognise a range of businesses, of course, and organisations pushing the boundaries across the sector. So, amongst the finalists, we've got wildlife businesses, a social enterprise, a cruise line, certification program, and accommodation providers. They're all forms of tourism that can be more sustainable. And the judges were looking for uh, those which had demonstrably taken responsibility, measured those impacts, and communicated them. So the awards demonstrate that any business, any destination can take responsibility and be more sustainable. We hope that the awards will inspire and educate, spur everybody on to challenge the sector to do even more. No less interestingly than five of the 12 panellists are from Africa. 
Seven other finalists, yeah. Seven other finalists, three from Asia, one from Australasia, and three from Europe. And I'm told that the judges uh, debated really long and hard about uh, around a shortlist to decide who those finalists were, and then again to choose the award winners, uh, leaving a group of very worthy, highly commended. So for this year only, the judges decided to abandon the gold and silver awards, and as I say, there are winners and highly commended to reflect the very different character of awards this year. There isn't an overall winner um, either, so that uh, reflects, I think, the diversity of applications that we've had in 2017. We're about to get started. Just a few things um, to get things running smoothly so we can get everybody processed. Uh, this year, we have 12 finalists, six winners, six highly commended. And I'll announce each of the winners and read a little bit about um, how it is they've come to win the prize before inviting them to join us on stage with Simon Press of uh, WETM and Harold Goodwin, who, as I've said, is the chair of the judges. He'll be presenting the awards. Then we'll then have a little, little bit of a chance to hear more about the work that they're doing for the winners uh, themselves, from the winners themselves. And um, so winners, don't get too excited. Um, remain seated until I call you to the stage. We do, of course, warmly congratulate the highly commended as well. Uh, don't worry, I haven't forgot about you. Uh, we will get you up for a photograph. I'll call you up, if I may, at the end of the ceremony. So this is the moment that we've been waiting for. Let's go to the first of the six winners. You ready? So the first winner is Choby Game Lodge in Botswana. And I'd like to interview Sue Ricketts, the UK representative, to come to the stage to receive the award. So, Chobi Game Lodge has been previously recognised in the Africa Responsible Tourism Awards, Best for Resource Management in 2015, and Best for Responsible Employment in uh, 2016. The judges recognised the breadth of their engagement with the Responsible Tourist Agenda, but were particularly impressed by their fleet of electric vehicles and commitment to reducing carbon emissions by introducing electrically powered vehicles and boats for game viewing and adopting solar energy and biodiesel. The guests enjoy a silentless, intrusive game drive and, and CO2 emissions are saved, contributing to achieving SDG 13. And combating climate change, at least one Zambian operation has followed that lead. So, Sue, let me ask you first of all, um, you're representing uh, Chobi here in, in the UK. Um, do you find that um, the outbound operators and consumers and so forth are, 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 are realising and appreciating your efforts? Very much so, yes. It's been a real draw card. It's quite a unique um, aspect. Um, silent safaris and... Uh, yes. So, how are consumers so, recognising what it is that you're doing? Uh, well, we're getting the message across through the tour operators, and they're in turn telling the consumers. Who are attracted to your business because they're looking for... I'm sorry. <laughs> who are attracted to your business because they're looking for uh, that type of holiday. Yes, yes, yes. It's all about that. that Botswana is um, a real eco-tourism yes. destination. So, yes. It's just Many congratulations. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, so let's get on um, to winner number two, um, which is Groot Boss. And I'd like to invite Fiona Mallon, Groot Boss, uh, UK representative, to come onto the stage. So Groot Boss has previously been recognised for its social impact in 2015. It won gold in the Africa Responsible Tourism Awards and silver in the World Awards for Achievements in Poverty Reduction. They're now in the fourth year of measuring, collecting and collating sustainability data to scope through. Three, using DEFRA emissions in line with the Greenhouse Gas Protocol reporting standards. They have significantly reduced their use of mains power by 10% in the last reporting year and installed a solar installation which powers Group Boss Garden Lodge and the Groot Boss Foundation. And just to say uh, congratulations to you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. I know it will mean um, a great deal to Michael and their team. It's a small team and they are making every effort against all of those measurements. 
Um, and you can see from what they've submitted that they really are a significant um, contributor to sustainable tourism. Thank you. And congratulations once again. Thank you. Right, so let's go on to our third winner now is Sapa, and I'd like to invite Mr. Dinyok Duk, who is the, uh, I'm sorry if I haven't pronounced that very well, Director of Tourism Marketing Department in Vietnam, uh, National Administration of Tourism, to represent Zappa to come on stage to receive the award on their behalf. So, um, so a female ethnic minority owned enterprise in Vietnam, employing 50 staff, two-thirds of whom are female, 90% of whom come from an ethnic minority. Sapa Ho Chao uh, comprises four interconnected parts of the boarding facility, the cafe, the Hinon handicraft store, and the tour operation, all with the same purpose in mind. Their vision is to create a life of opportunity for all their community, provide every youth with a high school education, all members of the community with an opportunity to obtain a sustainable career and engage with others. So in 2017, uh, Sapa Ochao has transitioned from being a company to a social enterprise and produced the second social impact report. From the outset, they have been committed to measuring, measurement, measurement, sorry, to measurement recognizing that only through measurement could they prove to others that they are making a difference learning what works and what doesn't, and be held accountable for their mission. So I just want to um, congratulate you very much and uh, shake your hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And well done. So many of my favorite destinations coming up here, Vietnam being one of them. Um, and one I visited in the summer and absolutely loved. It's our fourth winner, Ljubljana. <laughs> Beautiful place. So I'd like to invite uh, Petra Stusek, who is the Managing Director of Ljubljana Tourism, to come on stage and receive the award. So this beautiful city has developed a sustainable urban strategy adopted in 2016. It's now been implemented. The ambition is to be a safe and open city which represents diverse cultures believing in respectful and peaceful coexistence in diversity. They're using the OECD's recommended qualitative indicators for sustainable development. Ljubljana Tourism, um, the city's official destination marketing organization, is working to spread tourists beyond the city to encourage the use of public transport and encourage hotels to seek green certification. In 2015, a green supply chains project was launched to enable hotels and restaurants to purchase locally produced food and drinks through an online portal. In 2016, a survey showed 92% of residents believe that tourism had a positive effect on the development of the city and its identity, and the survey was repeated in areas of high tourism in, in, impact in 2017 with similar results. So congratulations once again. Let me get the microphone. So you've been encouraging sustainable mobility in Ljubljana. What does that mean? How does that work? It's, uh, it started, let's say, with encouraging. I mean, it's, it's the way how we live. It's not just the way how we think. Uh, I mean, it's the way how we think. It's not only for, the, um, uh, for achieving any goals it's since ever. But it started actually uh, for real, like a decade ago, when uh, the mayor decided to close the city center completely for traffic. Yes. And since then, the area, the walking area is expanding. So we needed to think of the local community who don't want to walk that much or do want to come to the central city market uh, and they need to carry stuff. So we put um, a lot of uh, electrical cars free of charge on the streets. Uh, we are encouraging the sharing uh, bike system. Uh, we love to walk. We love to, you know, it's... It's, um, like I said, it's the way of thinking that we encourage uh, also publicly and it's sticking with uh, local people and also, again, with, uh, with tourists as well. 
Very bright, smart nation. Thank you very much indeed. Congratulations. Thank you from the bottom of our green heart and welcome back anytime. Yeah. And the welcome, of course, goes to everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thoroughly recommend it. Thoroughly recommend it. Right. So let's move on now to our fifth winner, which is Transfrontier Parks Destinations. Yay! <laughs> So, uh, this is Tish Stewart English. I hope it is anyway. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so, let's uh, tell you a little bit more. Um... Right, so this is one of the strongest categories. To make a real contribution to sustainable development requires consistent effort over a number of years, as we know. It's about determining an appropriate strategy to address the major local issues, addressing those that can be addressed through tourism, then monitoring the progress. Yes, well, the judges were impressed by the depth and the quality of the data that TFPD was able to provide on employment and local supply chain impact. And um, the individual lodges um, being the focus of that and the tour operation as a whole. So FF, uh, TFPD has adopted a creating shared value approach and worked through its supply chain to establish independent micro enterprises and ensure their viability by providing regular business for them. So let's hear a little bit more. Welcome to you. No lack of energy there. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about what the lodges do. Okay, well, it's, it's really, it's the drop in the, in the river effect. You throw a pebble in and you see the rings go out and out and out. And it's really about creating a wider influence into communities. And that's what, that's what we believe. We really base our philosophy on the three-legged pot that we cook in in Africa. Our one leg is communities, our other leg is wildlife, and our other leg is environment. Without benefit to the communities, there won't be a wildlife or an environment for anybody to come and visit. So that's what we, that's the base of our, our beliefs. And we talked a little bit earlier about communicating what it is that you're yeah. doing. You're very good at doing this. Tell me how you do it. Well, we do it because we're very open and honest. We don't mind showing our figures. We don't mind showing exactly what we've invested, how much we've got out, where we've made mistakes, how we've fi fixed those mistakes, and we work with the communities consistently. Communication is key. Thank you so Thank much, you and so congratulations much. once you. again. <laughs> <Yay. laughs> right, let's go into our sixth winner, and final uh, winner, and then we'll go on to highly commended. It is Village Ways. So Manisha Pandey, Managing Director of Village Ways, is coming to the stage at high speed. Um, it's a Mumbai-based tour operator. It develops and markets walking trails through rural India. The walk is accommodated overnight in community-owned guest houses. So the villages own the guest houses and they are run and overseen by a committee responsible for recruiting the host team from a broad cross-section of village families for guiding, housekeeping, cooking, and so on. So typically working on a rotor system, sounds very well organized, and this ensures that the economic benefit of receiving guests goes to the village families as much as possible. Village Ways have used Just Report's yardstick to monitor e economic impact since 2013. Monitoring and transparent reporting is important to Village Ways because from the outset they were concerned that village enterprises should benefit as many households as possible, and that any flow of income to the household should be revealed and managed. A very, very exciting operation. Tell me how it was established. Well, it actually goes back a long story. I mean, 2004 is when we started, and uh, it was started because we were in a protected area, and we really thought that some of the villages inside the protected area needed tourism as an alternate source of livelihood. And uh, at that stage, we really, really didn't imagine it would be expanding into this level. But I think the core for us has been uh, the benefit sharing concept. And that is, I think, what has worked. Because it's not about involving one family in a village, but it, it means trying to help 
possibly every household in the village. And that was a big challenge, but I still feel that concept has been working and it's evident that, you know, benefit sharing, a wider sharing benefit to concept works for a longer term. And the families, how difficult was it to get them to engage or were they immediately excited by the idea? No, I think, you know, uh, because we have relatively always worked with, I mean, starting with our first project in Binsa with places which were not having any experience of tourism in the past. And therefore, there were many uh, hesitations to get involved. Because tourism, you know, as such, as we all know, has different faces. It could have mm. many negatives and there could be many dangers of tourism that could be seen and perceived by people. So engagement by people was not very spontaneous. But since I said that, you know, it was a different concept of involving an entire village rather than one yeah. family or a household. So people probably accepted it and took that chance. And then after a year or so, when it, they saw things happening, then I think it is always easier for the next project to yeah, take place. Yeah, the momentum started going. Well, many congratulations thank so and thank much. you very much thank indeed. You. Right, so how are we doing for time? We've got loads of time. We've got loads of time. Um, right, so now we have the highly commended. Um, so I would like uh, to invite each of them to come to the stage and collect their award and uh, be in a group photograph. Harold, as chair of the judges, um, um, he wanted to, me to remind you that um, being the difference, the difference between a winner and highly commended is very small indeed. You've heard uh, what these companies have been doing. It's extraordinarily impressive. And that also goes for the highly commended. Um, so, I would like um, to invite you to stand at the stage um, here uh, to be ready um, for the group photo once I call your name. So, the first is Crystal Creek Meadows and Chris Warren. Um, would you like to come up on stage um, to receive your award? So the judges here were impressed by his engagement of the guests in reducing their energy and water consumption and the environmental savings achieved. And the next highly commended. Green Tourism and Andrea Nicholas, the Managing Director, is coming on stage, I hope, to receive the award. Now, they're taking a lead on reducing and benchmarking carbon emissions and encouraging their members to publicly support their emission savings, moving towards Certification Plus. Right, so that's two of you. Okay. And you've seen him before, and we've heard a lot about his work. Not enough, I feel. But Kerala, India, and Dr. Venu Vasudevan, who is the principal secretary there, please come to the stage to receive your award. The judges here recognize the groundbreaking achievement in undertaking and publishing the first census of the positive and negative impacts of tourism on a village. Next, highly commended, uh, Richard Vine of Old Pajeta Cons Cons Conservancy. Please come up on stage to receive your award. The judges here are impressed by the wide range of ways in which Old Pajeta achieves and reports sustainability, benefiting both communities and conservation. Next. Marine Dynamics, Brenda Dutois of Marine Dynamics, please come to the stage. The judges here, impressed by the scale of the contribution to conservation and the way that Marine Dynamics reports this. Next, Dewey Cruises and Lucienne Dam, please come to stage. The judges here wanted to recognize the groundbreaking work done across the cruise line to reduce negative and increase their positive impacts. So, could we get the finalists now back on the stage for um, a family photo? Are we all ready for the photo? Everybody together? Do I get to feature in this one? Do I get to feature?
now what? All the finalists. And all the finalists, please. All the finalists, please. Calling to the stage. Yeah. Can we have you on the stage for a group photo? Quickly. Good, well done. So it just remains for me to say thank you so much um, for putting up with me this morning. I've had a great time um, meeting all of the guests, the panelists. Congratulations once again to the winners. It seems to me that great progress is being made, so let's uh, show them how it's done and keep it up. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tanya. Well done to all the winners. There are some great examples of responsible tourism best practice, which I'm delighted at WTM London is able to highlight, recognize, and reward. At WTM London, we are incredibly proud to host the WTM Responsible Tourism Awards as part of the biggest day of responsible tourism action in the world, which you are all a part of. I would like to praise Justin Francis and his team at Responsible Travel for their leadership and foresight to have been the founders of these awards back in 2004. For this year and future years, we have taken over the sole running of the awards as they are an integral part of World Responsible Tourism Day and they are also part of everything we are looking to achieve at WTM London and across the portfolio of our events. We also support our responsible tourism advisor, Harold Goodwin's commitment to expand the awards around the globe, with the awards now firmly established in India, Ireland, and Africa. The fourth edition of the African Awards will be presented at WTM Africa in Cape Town and will be sponsored by Westgrow. There will be over five categories in the African Awards. They are Sustainable Development Goals, Decent work, innovation in water management, marine and freshwater wildlife conservation, and cultural experience. The WTM World, the WTM World Responsible Tourism Awards will be back at WTM London next year with the awards focusing on wildlife conservation, decent work, local economic benefit, communications, coping with success and for a place or destination, taking the greatest responsibility for making tourism more sustainable. Now remember, the judges can only select from the nominations submitted. So please do enter your company or destination for the awards. 
Thank you for taking part in today's WTM Responsible Tourism Day opening ceremony. Please attend these sessions this afternoon and, of course, the Responsible Tourism drinks this evening. Enjoy the rest of WTM London 2017 and I look forward to seeing you all here next year for WTM London 2018, 5th to the 7th of November. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.